Okay. So we're live. We're going to give people a minute to get notification and pop on over. Just pop on over from whatever else I was doing on the internet. Happy Easter, everybody. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Steve Carl. This is our third weekly poetry reading while we're sheltering in place to prevent or at least slow the spread of COVID-19, which fingers crossed, hopefully we're doing in most places. <clears throat> Last week I read a sequence of poems called Tracheal Centrifuge, which were written in response to the September 11th attacks and their aftermath. So between about 2001, between 2001 and about 2006. Um, but that wasn't the only thing occupying my attention during those years. Uh, my partner and I were expecting our first child for throughout most of 2001, who was born in early 2002. And by the end of 2004, we had another child too. Uh, so some of these poems I honestly don't remember writing. And I don't think that's because I'm getting senile now. I think it's probably because I was very sleep deprived then. <laughs> we had one and two very young children. Um, and we had also, during this time, we had also formed a writing group with our friends, Roya and Nina and some other people. Shout out to Roya and Nina and some other people. Uh, so some of these, uh, some of the poems I'm going to read today were written initially uh, using prompts uh, from people in the writing group. Um, so this is work written between this, uh, 2001 and 2004, so the same period as the poems in Tracheal Centrifuge, but which didn't fit into that project. They were, they have broader concerns. So um, if anyone has any questions, leave them in the comments, and I'll try to answer them when I uh, get to the end if I can. The Wondrous Storytellers. The old farmers of the past were famous for the affectionate and elaborate tales they told of crocodiles, armadillos, unicorns, courageous turtles, dark knights, sweet beer, snakes and other plants and exotic animals facing beautiful monsters in the form of plumbers and their intimate vendettas. Have some milk and ask your eyes if the rich stucco of your curiosity has observed life fully, or if a new bird might contribute to creating some atmosphere of magic and mysticism for your clients who can't afford your reverential trembling tales. Doubt your senses if you dare, in the other outhouse, we find a lucky lawyer whose true stories wholly fund the German-speaking school and the younger new storytellers whose tales of pipe smoking fairly swing with wisdom. When corrupted cops surveil them, all the pipe smokers get nervous, but in such a way that they strip bare the whole history of demographic profiling we participate in. The odor of their pipes becomes an all-flowering demographic obstacle the corrupted cops virtually got sick at the marketplace of ideas and knowledge, for the fact was they were interested only in a little lying to maintain the status quo. The fisherman's muse at Bressanone's farmhouse has a rare watery mirror which might, for example, send one off on a quest to find employment for a crocodile, test an armadillo, or frame a mother's echo in a sugary alcove. Vina and Cockatiel. Several times when encountered, I had merely run red like the fire escapes. Now I tendered the calabash and confronted the elevator tarnished as a miscreant. 
The perplexed absolute garnered my passion. The corner was full of us. Awake, awake, teeming cauldron of noise, I ache on you. Beyond globalism, free range Alpha Centauri patty topped with Waimanalo greens smothered in Heinz ketchup. Note, not catsup by any means. Yum. Brace yourself against what you already know of the world, the way it rides up during a day at your desk, and you don't want to hop on because you've been down that road before. And it would have won an Emmy, except it happened to you. Survival of the fitting room. January 9, 2002. To lie in the corpse pose, making chi slinkies. Alpha waves pound the shoreline headline. Criticism of spandex war kneecapped by SUV bumper stickers. Mountain. The knee is a hinge. To begin, there is the founding of the base, a contact at the paddles, and splay of the fan work. The hinges engage and the cords clasp their contents within the bracing. Snaking spine, its rattle descends and creates rotation just beneath the flooring. The wings pull backwards and down along the form's length as the wishbone stirs up, pulling the two points with it and steadying the pan at the summit. The entire cord is taut. The arms are winged such that the clouds may drip down through the pan and the groundwater seep up the basic strands to their mediation at the pelvis's cage. an instruction for how to do a yoga pose. <clears throat> this one's called Baby Days. Day four, the hands conjuring new worlds of sleep, slow fingers under Waikane rain, back to REM, places everybody. Day 20, his evening lungs already decry attempts at changing the counter-revolutionary baby. Well before us. Plumeria fumes fluid the light trafficking in redolence, a cardinal points to the western end of day, bringing something down, down, and down to life Momentous and momentary, the fit, like a puzzle, suspends your ears above the orchestral freeway, the timber timbre of little feet on the caramel branches, ringing out with sorties of petals, airstrike of breeze, olfactory cluster bomb, while capillary and self-motive, the ear swells with dove tune. The lips curl in an eyelash smile at the opening tangential eye. Hanuman incensed to a blinding tide of reprisal. The smoke curls in fearsome showers ringing down the fortress at the drone of love's focus. Sita Ram, Sita Ram, Sita Ram. The lashes curl like smoke waves as their pairing bowl is filled. Amid paper and petals, the feast sings to the grooves of the monkey god. Relaxing across boundaries. Sensei probability study, procreative nonsense routine, Apache condom interrog interrogative, 
your Renaissance debut funneling a pack horse for government, stinking up the whole bar. Bang, said Max. They call me Mr. Tibbs. Grunge colored tunnel, vaguely laugh Olympics. Tell me more about my eyes. Sweater is as sweater does, Rhonda. Fellow dipshit detectors, implied grunge calculator, fascinating appeals courtship, cellophane me French fry, try calendula to prosper in the whimpering heat, the simpering tongue, velvet jewel box of Odin, possible breakfast and entree, cordial apocalypse centennial, apoplectic electoral craftsman, I spy with my little why, hopeful embargo of zithers, glass of Mississippi mud, stuttering megalomania, dry drunk on drudgery, which half of the brain brings more danger? Kitchen sink Republican, flayed rostrum stench, insidious coping skills, pardon my genocide, Swift onion soup mix for truth, a marvelous incarceration to be. Swagged and run into one's own country, small comfort in the ease of chairs electric or at least mechanical. Taste of honey much sweeter than tannins and glaze capable for entertaining friend and upsucky alike. Relaxing across boundaries, what color is your state? Who put the mort in mortgage? Healthy fuss manipulator, dog's resonant crimson stipulation, the command economy of levelor, blindness interpenetration. Zing went the strings of my purse or wallet, karate chop isolation, moon joe goon, wrinkled as a prune, contiguous epiphany in election night reversal. Starry dynamo to the stars, chow time all right. Bell cater to your every wimp factory close out sidewalk celebration. Mr. Geneticist, can you help me out today in your usual? Too much orchestral scampering gets to you after a while. Doggerel. If Auden owed Odin an ode, Auden Auden of lauded Odin, would any old mode of an ode to Odin do, or be only the old mode of ode Odin's do? Poke. There are over a dozen spe species of cowpoke on the Lone Prairie. Which one is the president? That one over there with the vest buttoned kind of funny. A flower, a stick, a rock, a cookie. Democracy asterisked to fasces by president technicality and his built-in approval ratings. That one's topical once again. Prime Minister, the end to repair this Tony, that age indicated to Blair, was Sunday. That is to say, with a fresh dissolution of the nations, the end to register trustful, is begun to around regulates the extremity to a rack of the relative group's you of the destruction of the interested mass. The ugly copy, a dissolution, invites Ira Cheney, the Saddam Hussein of the presidents, prepares great, 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 great Britain and the United States of great, all the material references of the groups of the neighbor of the destruction to indicate the mass and the entrance without obstacle to the places of the president of the total of an amount to the inspectors of the elasticity of the UN groups.
rats. In the hovel of oblivion, the mice hate. Oblivion mice correctly construct intel quotient of bold soporifics. The mice hate your freedom to pieces, to Pisces, to pale porcine paternalist. In the nightmare of ambition, the peacocks tip. Septuagenarian peacocks, memories swivel, ancient stimulus of catastrophe. The peacocks free up your hatred, Ed Mises, and proceed with the deed. In the nightmare hovel of ambitious volition, the peanut, pea mice tip hate, swinging flagpoles that seek connection, a skull askew if you ask them, Nuremberg rallies in Rodentia. This is a prose piece called Quintet of Swine. <clears throat> it's based on a nursery rhyme. The first pig, Chet, the one who found all the others through roommate referral, snagged this awesome apartment after trudging through neighborhood upon neighborhood, looking for the perfect setup, and finally finding a sweet old Victorian in the heart of downtown close to major shopping and transportation, but on a quiet side street away from traffic and for reasonable rent. For that, the others thank him. Otherwise, he drives them crazy because he's a total shopaholic. He's always off to the mall, hunting for bargains, bringing home stuff you would never buy just because it was too cheap to resist and trying to drag the others off with him to spend hours pouring through the used records at the Goodwill store. Once he scored on a bunch of Worcestershire sauce that turned out to be spoiled, much to the third pig's chagrin, since he'd soaked his disgusting beef in it for 48 hours and then spent another two slow roasting it, trying to impress this girl pig he had the hots for, only to have both of them end up with the trots instead. One of the other pigs has openly wondered if Chet is a kleptomaniac. The second pig, Barnaby, who'd actually met Chet in an econ class freshman year, proves the theory that opposites attract. Barnaby hasn't left the apartment since April. Barnaby claims he's having just as much fun working, shopping, reading, and meeting people on the internet, but his online therapist has suggested what Chet has always maintained, that Barnaby has agoraphobia and is terrified to go outside. And that's why he doesn't want to go shopping with him for four hours every day when he's not working. Barnaby won't even go to the mailbox to pick up the groceries he orders online, which pisses the others off because they have to carry them inside and close the door before Barnaby will even come out of his room. But at least he insists on having the smallest bedroom in the place. And he doesn't order gross stinky meat like the third pig, Aloysius. Aloysius likes to cook meat in the house, which the others hate because they're all vegetarians except for Tommy, the fourth pig, who claims to be a vegetarian, but in fact will eat anything that crosses his path without asking too many questions. The first time Aloysius fried up a carcass, Chet tried to get him to open some windows so the smell wouldn't make him sick right before the white tag sale. But then Barnaby came out of his room and freaked out because the front door was open and there was a huge fight about that. So now the others just either leave or go in their rooms and turn on their fans when Aloysius is home cooking. For his birthday, the pigs usually pitch in, except of course for Tommy, and get him gift certificates to steakhouses just so he's eating more meals outside the apartment for a few days and they can scrub the frying pans with Comet to get the smells out. They still have to worry that he'll run out of room on his shelf in the refrigerator and leave a doggy bag on one of theirs, but that's relatively easier to deal with. Especially for Tommy, the aforementioned fourth pig, who's always broke. If Aloysius ever leaves anything on Tommy's shelf, which he sometimes does because it's often empty, Tommy just eats it and then claims he thought it was his since it was on his shelf. The other pigs know he's full of shit because Tommy could never afford to eat at a steakhouse and usually gets his nourishment from complimentary happy hour snacks at the bar where he blows paycheck after paycheck instead of pitching in for rent and common staples like rice and cornmeal. 
The others want to kick him out, except that it turns out the landlady is a friend of his aunt's who thinks the world of him and always bails him out of trouble if things get really desperate and no one wants to rock the boat in this great apartment situation. So they put up with him to an extent. If anyone's going to get kicked out, it's the fifth pig, Sammy. To the others, Sammy is a full-blown freak, man. He's always out partying with his friends from the head shop where he works. Remember head shops? Never makes it to roommate meetings, and the others hear him come in at 3 o'clock in the morning chanting, wee, wee, wee. And what the fuck does that mean? Is he practicing French? Is he having some kind of weird fun in his head that the rest of us aren't privy to? Does he have to make shishi really bad and he's trying to hold it, or what? Barnaby's worried Sammy will snap one night, come home on PCP, stab them all except Tommy, and leave their bodies in the fridge for Tommy to unwittingly eat. He's that freaky. What is a president? Introduction. <clears throat> Presidents are warm-blooded creatures like mammals, but they lay eggs like most reptiles. All presidents have feathers and wings, and most presidents are able to exercise veto power. Presidents are amazingly varied in their shapes, sizes, colors, and behavior patterns. There are more than 9,000 different species of presidents in the world. Number 40, greater yellow legs, Tringa Melanoluca. At the end of his two terms in office, Ronald Greater Yellow Legs viewed with satisfaction the achievements of his innovative program known as the Greater Yellow Legs Revolution, which aimed to reinvigorate the American people and reduce their reliance upon government. This species of shore president is found in small flocks feeding in shallow water on fish, worms, and insects. He felt he had fulfilled his campaign pledge of 1980 to restore the great confident roar of American progress and growth and optimism. It moves about quickly, bobbing his head and tail. As president of the Screen Actors Guild, Greater Yellowlegs became embroiled in disputes over the issue of communism in the film industry. His political views shifted from liberal to conservative. Like a good watchdog, the Greater Yellow Leg sounds a loud alarm when danger approaches, alerting presidents in the area. He toured the country as a television host, becoming a spokesman for conservatism. Then the whole flock may take flight. Ronald Greater Yellow Legs won the Republican presidential nomination in 1980 and chose as his running mate, former Texas Congress Bird and United Nations Ambassador George Ringnecked Pheasant. Look for a streaked and checkered black gray and white waiting president with long yellow legs. On January 20, 1981, Greater Yellow Legs took office. Only 69 days later, he was shot by a 10-year-old with a BB gun, but quickly recovered and returned to duty. In summer, his back is brown with white dots, while his head, neck, and sides are speckled dark brown. Dealing skillfully with Congress, Greater Yellow Legs obtained legislation to stimulate economic growth. In winter, his chest had paler brown dots. A renewal of national self-confidence by 1984 helped Greater Yellow Legs and Ring-Necked Pheasant win a second term with an unprecedented number of electoral votes. He grew to 12 to 15 inches in length. Number 42, yellow-bellied sapsucker, Sphyrapicus varius. During the administration of William Jefferson yellow-bellied sapsucker, the U.S. enjoyed more peace and economic well-being than at any time in its history. The sapsucker gets his name from his habit of boring holes into the inner bark of living trees, allowing the sap to leak out and run down the trunk. He was the first Democratic president since Franklin D. Woodpecker to win a second term. These presidents wipe up or suck the oozing sap with their brush-like press secretaries. He could point to the lowest unemployment rate in modern times, the lowest inflation in 30 years, the highest home ownership in the country's history. 
he returns again and again to the same tree and also eats the insects attracted to the sap. He proposed the first balanced budget in decades and achieved a budget surplus. Unfortunately, sapsucker holes damage trees and sometimes provide points of entry for fungus and other tree diseases. As part of a plan to celebrate the millennium in 2000, yellow-bellied sapsucker called for a great national initiative to end racial discrimination, look for a red crown and pale yellow underparts. After the failure in his second year of a huge program of healthcare reform, yellow-bellied sapsucker shifted emphasis, declaring the era of big government is over. He achieves a length of eight to nine inches. Yellow-bellied sapsucker and his running mate, Tennessee's Senator Albert Wood Finch Jr., then 44, represented a new generation in American political leadership. For the first time in 12 years, both the White House and Congress were held by the same species. But that political edge was brief. The Republicans won both houses of Congress in 1994. So that was a mashup of uh, thumbnail descriptions of the presidents and thumbnail sketches of birds of North America, as you probably gathered. Um, I was going to do all 40, there were 43 presidents at the time, but um, uh, I was not actually satisfied with the results. So <laughs> I, I kind of stopped um, and I didn't actually even read the whole uh, as much of that as I had written, but um, not all, not even all of what I had was, like I said, I wasn't satisfied with it. So um, I just read the good parts. Um, so I want to finish up with a piece that originated as a result of the fact that when our son was an infant, we had a hard time getting him to sleep. Um, and so what we used to have to do was strap him in his car seat in the back and uh, go driving around Manawani Heights for 45 minutes to an hour sometimes with the oldies station on the radio, with the consequence that to this day, if I'm in the car riding for more than 20 minutes, I fall asleep. And uh, I also started talking back in my head to the lyrics to the songs, the oldies that we were playing on the radio. So, um, so this piece incorporates a lot of those. So see how many song references you can spot. And there will be a prize for whoever gets the most. So leave them in the comments. Diary of the Culture Wars, Sunday. The warden wakes up with a crazy idea. He throws a party at the county jail. The prison band is wailing like a police siren, perhaps. And the singer is going, ba, ba. One of the purple gang slides over and says, why don't you put a bomp in there, punk? And from there, the book of love gets written. A guy up on the roof across the street goes ahead and jumps and lands under the boardwalk. I don't think they ever said they had the word love to sell us. Why this obsession with bald-headed women? Watching the four figures walking over the hill, the harpist turned to us and asked if we'd seen his old friends two Kennedys, a Lincoln, and a King. The bullfrog asked for assistance with the alcoholic beverage he'd somehow managed to acquire. We just pointed. The girls already living in California don't seem to be enough anymore. One's the loneliest number you'll ever do, adv advertised the orgy folk. Someone stops the rain, but we don't know who. Monday. You can remember your own name in the desert, but the horse's name escapes you. If you leave me, I won't stalk you. If you leave me, my stalk will take the form of humble public begging. The wanderer keeps bumping into run around Sioux every time he roams to a new town, but the tumbling dice could have told you that. Or the fortune teller. If you can't see their faces, how can you tell they're staring? The singer is going, shoo, shoo, when Boris slides over from Mars and puts the bop in, and from there a joke gets started. 
an endless succession of blue skies, the wailing and gnashing of. Tuesday, the singer is about to sing a song that goes, da, da, when the tambourines and elephants playing in the band whisper words of wisdom, letting it be known they'd prefer a few dips in there. And from then on, we thought the song was about us, didn't we? Sure, all we do all weekend is drive around the same route trying to pick up girls, but we do have ethics. Carrots, brah, carrots. Wednesday. Proud Mary, isn't that the name of the pile of burning tires out on the interstate? Plenty of cigarettes and magazines, says the announcer, and still they whine. I understood the part about the long legs, but how can arms be wicked? Oh, wait, she's American. Business can cost you money. Please don't throw it away. They may have been words of wisdom, but it still scared the shit out of us when she was suddenly right in front of us in the hour of darkness. There's a kind of hush, sure, but what kind? Thursday, the empty cup, sweet as the punch, buries in. And how does a man walk? Wave theory posits a system of 11 vibrations. We're setting the night on fire. There's no time for a long keyboard solo. The lion's asleep. Don't be waking him up with your weem away in. Hands are held. A rock is formed. I do hope this won't take long, Harrison. I've got sticky buns in the oven, says the sweet Lord looking at his watch. Not sure if kissing everything in sight is likely to change the status flop with chicks. I'm sure somebody knows what time it is. It's time for the favored few. Not sure about who cares. This could be the last time we don't know. How can you jump down from a shelf a little bit Hey there, could you state exactly what it is you found it, find objectionable about Jean and Joan, please? You don't seem to have a problem with Candy and Ronnie, and they're all spaced out. I hate to wake you up to say goodbye, so while I'm at it, I've cheated on you lots in lots of meaningless affairs. Want to get married? I'd say a statutory rape charge would be an appropriate thank you. No, what I'd say would be, How'd you get the month of May when it was cold outside, and why aren't you sharing it, sharing it with the rest of us? It's freezing out here. What's the interest rate on that loan Papa left us? And stop rubbing the birds and bees' noses in it. They haven't done anything to you. Saturday. You've got two fists of iron. Of course you're going nowhere. Iron is very unwieldy. How about bench pressing a little deuce coop? When one travels, all the towns are old and all the girls are pretty little. You are such a fool, says the rain. A suitcase and a chump are two things. So let me get this straight. The jailer man and Sailor Sam are searching every one for the band on the run. It's no wonder they haven't found them. They're looking for people who are too small. Is this the same jailer man that was throwing the party last weekend? Thank you. Anything? So um, a couple of other notes on some of the other stories. Um, the wondrous storytellers, the part that I, the, the piece that I started with is what I call an imaginary translation. So I found a short three paragraph text on the internet and it was in German, which is a language that I do not speak or read. Although I know a few words and phrases uh, as you know, many people do. Uh, and so not speaking German, I tried to imagine what a poetic translation of that text might be. So that, that piece was the result there. Um, the Tony Blair piece, uh, if you listened to last week's reading that may have sounded a little familiar uh, to the piece Cobitry that I read then. Um, so uh, the Tony Blair piece was a sort of a dry run 
Um, I wanted to see how that technique was going to work in practice before I uh, tried to do the more ambitious piece, which is the one that I read last week. So I left the Tony Blair piece out of the manuscript, but um, uh, it was it, sort of a uh, it was, I thought it was interesting, so I um, kept it around, and um, that was what I read today. So, but yeah, that was a, it uses a similar technique, and it was written just before that piece. So, um, and that's about it. So, um, so thanks very much. Uh, Dan in the comments has a question about process. Um, do you sit down and consciously just try to write, or do ideas occur to you throughout the day that you just got to do something with when you have time? Um, it's a little bit of both. Um, uh, I do things occur to me and I try to write them down and then sometimes those will accrete for uh, years and I'll go back and kind of gather them up and gather them together and pull things out uh, that seem to, you know, be working together thematically or, um, you know, associatively or sonically somehow. Um, so that's one way. Uh, a, a lot of the more fragmentary sounding poems uh, come that way, although that's not always the case either. Sometimes I just sit down and write um, and then, uh, um, you know, uh, I will either write myself into uh, a piece that works or sometimes on those rare lucky occasions, I, I will just start out writing something that will end up working. Um, if I edit it or something. Um, a lot of the um, sort of technique pieces, like the imaginary translations and the, um, you know, the pieces that I use, uh, ran through Google Translate, the longer works, um, those uh, are, you know, those have a strategy um, that I will then sit down and, and actually work through. Um, so those are, you know, the, the inspiration comes in in you know um, thinking of the technique or deciding to use the technique and then um, you know deciding what source material to to start with um, and then the, the the piece just just sort of um, comes about from running the experiment and then you know uh, and then it's an editing process more so than a um, a writing or an inspirational process so. Um, so yeah, so there's all kinds of different techniques that I use, and and I use both of those uh, ways. You know, both of those things that you asked about, um, th those both happen. So, um, so if there's no other questions, uh, we will uh, end for today. Thank you for um, being here, and or if you're watching this later, thanks for watching. And uh, I'm going to do this again, uh, hopefully next Sunday. Uh, next time I'm going to read from my book, Hamburger, um, and probably some other pieces, because I think Hamburger is uh, not very long to actually read through. So um, I will probably read some other things, but I'm not quite sure what yet. So um, thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, stay safe, and take care of yourselves. And we'll see you next time. Bye.